Uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm Jim Ballingall. I'm the executive director of the initiative for cryptocurrencies and contracts. And I'm going to be addressing this question, can academic research enhance fair treatment for DeFi operators and users? And as you might suspect, I'm going to argue for the affirmative and I'll let you judge uh, my success at the end. <clears throat> so first of all, who is IC3? And uh, what do we pursue? Um, who's heard of IC3 before? Okay, we got, oh, very good, yeah. Brandon, good to see you here. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten here, it weren't for uh, helpful um, <clears throat> assistance from Brandon, who I ran into uh, acres away from here. Uh, so IC3, who's heard of Eamon Gunsur? Okay, good. Well, he about the same number. Uh, he's the CEO of Ava Labs, and uh, he came out of uh, IC3. I'll talk about that in a moment. But faculty from nine universities, uh, and plus some industry and foundation stakeholders. Uh, and we work in three areas. First of all, it's world-class research, as, as you might expect, with the, the academic um, participation. And it's really advancing the science, we say advancing the science of blockchains. Now, I uh, approached a banker in New York City with this uh, value proposition some time ago, and, and they looked at me kind of cockeyed and, and said, uh, well, Jim, we don't do academic -y stuff here. And um, I, in back of my mind, I'm thinking academic -y, that's not actually a real word, but I'll roll with it. And I said, well, we do academic -y stuff, as you might expect. I mean, we're professors and PhD students, so we publish papers, we present a top uh, conferences with other academics and sometimes industry scientists and so on. Um, but we also work in other ways. And, and the way that we could help you, uh, Mr. Bank Banker, is in future proofing your investment. And that uh, little light bulb went off because uh, they were working in blockchains a few years ago and they were encountering problems daily and could foresee that problems would be coming up in the future. And so we, we've used that as a pillar, and, and it's, um, it's not just uh, wordsmithing, it's um, really actual collaboration with the people who sponsor our research, as well as the community at large. The third pillar we're very active in is in forming a public, uh, public policy, I would say, or government policy, um, really in terms mostly in, um, in, in, in uh, illustrating and describing the limitations technically on um, possibilities that, that blockchains present. So those are the three pillars that, that we work in. It is uh, by far the world's largest faculty-led initiative uh, pursuing this, this avenue of research and um, is also the most productive in, in each of these areas. So for example, in the third area, uh, one of our faculty, Ari Jules, uh, testified in front of Congress uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, the subject was proof of work. Um, he was arguing against proof of work as a, a way of, of uh, uh, providing consensus mechanism for a blockchain. Um, as you know, proof of work um, uses a tremendous amount of energy and uh, therefore is uh, deleterious to the environment. So we're looking, we're researching for and AVA Labs is one of such uh, innovations come out of IC3 that actually uh, does get around proof of work. So here are the uh, universities involved. They stretch from UC Berkeley all the way to Haifa, Israel. Um, and here's some of the key uh, folks that are involved in each of those. And um, I must say I neglected to uh, list one of the people in the audience, uh, Professor Maureen O'Hara. Will you just wave, Maureen? <laughs> uh, who's an esteemed uh, researcher in, in finance from Cornell. Uh, and um, well, as I said, these are, I think, really a who's who of uh, folks that are uh, top research advantage. We select the people who come into IC3. They're invited uh, because of a track record in, in publishing uh, and um, leading PhD students in Serena for several years. And here's um, uh, some photos to uh, attach the names. Marines uh, down here in the lower, uh, lower right. You may recognize this individual in the lower left. Uh, that's the aforementioned uh, Eamon Gunsir. Uh, Eamon was uh, Goon, as we uh, like to refer to him. Uh, was really one of the key instigators between, behind forming IC3 uh, about seven years ago. 
and he has um, unfortunately left IC3 because he left Cornell. He's not a professor there. IC3 is faculty, so um, by leaving, he's not a faculty member. Um, we wish he will come back soon. Uh, I think he's an academician at heart, uh, as any of you who talked to him or listened to his presentations or read his papers. Uh, but for now, he's um, obviously um, ensconced in leading Ava Labs and doing a fantastic job. I heard there's 4,000 people at this event. Uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I also want to mention just who the IC3, some of the IC3 partners and, and sponsors are, the donors who fund the research and also provide uh, information and uh, guidance on where they see problems coming up now and in the future and where we might focus our research efforts. And it's a collection of uh, very large players in our community as, as well as startup companies. Uh, one more slide just to give an overview of IC3 and, and then we'll get into some of the DeFi related work. Um, and I think this is an important slide so I included it. It's, uh, it's our grand challenges that really drive and inform the research directions. Um, there's seven of them currently. Uh, the first is uh, around scaling and consensus. Uh, the second is um, correct by construction. That's the idea of you write a contract, it will perform as you've intended it. Um, <clears throat> confidentiality, how do you balance uh, transparency and privacy. Authenticated data feeds, uh, obviously Chainlink is a, a notable partner with us in that regard. Uh, safety and compliance, how do you audit, um, prevent nefarious activity on a blockchain. Sound migration is a relatively new one. It's, it came uh, from one of our financial colleagues. They were looking at how do we migrate or connect the legacy infrastructure we have with a new blockchain and do that in a reliable fashion. And the last uh, uh, global challenge we added was social good. Uh, we have a solution now, it's not been deployed yet, but it's a solution that uh, automatically um, distributes uh, carbon credits to people who are investing and uh, deploying uh, new trees in the Amazon. Okay, so um, with that, we'll get into some of the DeFi research and there's, there's um, actually four areas that I'm going to talk about. I'll talk in depth about the second one here, which is MEV. Who's heard of MEV before? Okay, most of you. So it, uh, it originally was, the phrase was coined minor extractable value, uh, but it's also uh, referred to these days as maximum extractable value. And it's basically um, uh, revenue that can be collected from a, a profit, I should say, connected from a blockchain by virtue of uh, order manipulation, transaction manipulation. Uh, ME, uh, IC3 actually identified this, uh, defined it, and uh, measured the scope of MEV about uh, three years ago. And we have since uh, begun to uh, provide tools and frameworks to detect it, uh, to estimate its uh, extent, and to mitigate it or even prevent it. Um, so it involves things like uh, detecting front running, back running, transaction editing, uh, censorship, and, and actually going further is fair ordering. What is fair ordering? Uh, how do you define fair ordering? And, and if you can define it, uh, and I'll show you some ideas about defining it, um, can you implement it? Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that in the next few slides. I'm gonna say at the end of that, a little bit of wor words, a um, few words about what we're doing with uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Uh, we've just participated, we did our own NFT drop with a, a prominent artist just two or three weeks ago, uh, working in fractionalizable NFTs. Um, and uh, 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 another uh, interesting um, new financial instrument is multi-party flash loans. So an atomic transfer amongst multiple parties, if you can get your head wrapped around that. But the idea here in this, in this third bullet is, is uh, composing uh, building new financial instruments that are, that are reliable. Uh, so we also do work in incentives, incentivizing honest behavior, de-incentivizing dishonest behavior, working on crypto economic guarantees, do a lot of work in layer one and layer two. Uh, for example, in layer two, we're doing some work in multi-party computation, 2.0 we call it, 
led by Andrew Miller at the University of Illinois. And last but not least, the fourth bullet, we're doing some work in decentralized identity solutions and security. Okay, well, to tee up the MEV discussion, it's, uh, I think, useful to go back and look at this expose that was written by Michael Lewis in 2014 on high-frequency trading. And uh, Maureen, of course, <laughs> is a financier as well and well-connected with Wall Street, well aware of all this work. So some of the characteristics are uh, arbitrage bots and algorithms, front running, really was uh, led by big investment in low, low latency, that is very high speed connections from the brokerage houses uh, to, to Wall Street. Now, arbitrage per se is not a bad thing. I mean, uh, you can, it's basically making trades uh, um, across markets. So buy a dozen bananas and Zanzibar for 10 cents, sell them in New York City for a dollar. The, the arbitrage we're concerned about here that usually makes any of us, I think, in this room cry foul is when a large, powerful uh, entity is able to take advantage of uh, financially a, uh, a less uh, privileged uh, or powerful um, investor, typically an individual investor. So there was a flurry of, of investigation came out as a result of this book. And um, there were some pros and cons uh, debated, but uh, generally there was a strong sense that high frequency trading is bad for consumers. And I think there's also a sense that the analogy of this in blockchain is, is uh, bad for consumers. Um, but blockchains, we think this time it's different. So uh, back in 2008, Bitcoin was born. Uh, here's um, Occupy Wall Street folks, uh, Bitcoin revolution, it's all was back to, you know, power to the people. Let's take power away from the big advantaged financial institutions and put it back in the people's own hands so they don't have to suffer in a financial meltdown in the future. So it was a, a vision of purely peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cash, uh, no governments involved, no intermediaries that can take, take, uh, take a skim off the top, etc. Um, and the Tapscott book um, articulates this vision in 2017, uh, build integrity in all institutions, create a more secure and trustworthy world. And I think we can all get behind that. Uh, uh, it was uh, some hype and, and there's some hope in it. So um, let's go to how we, how we uh, look into this a little deeper. So it, it comes really down to consensus and, and how you look at ordering transactions. Uh, consensus is a, a field that goes back uh, almost 50 years now in distributed systems. Uh, if you're interested looking more in the history of this, uh, Gunsir did a, does a marvelous talk on it. I'm sure you can find it pretty quickly on YouTube or on the IC3 uh, YouTube channel. Um, and the notion is that um, in a distributed system, for example, a cloud computing cluster, uh, nodes may fail and you want to be able to replicate those nodes, reset them uh, with reliable data. Um, how do you go about doing that? In a blockchain, um, you actually don't just have nodes failing, you have uh, malicious nodes who are uh, trying to change the characteristics of the blockchain to advantage themselves. Um, <clears throat> so the goal here, is what we're trying to just show here, is uh, the, the pink node is a uh, malicious actor and the rest of the nodes are honest nodes. And the goal, of course, is to um, promote to the system, publish the result where the nodes agree on a, a single message or a collection of messages. So there's a concept in Byzantine agreement um, of, um, well, the, the validity. And there's two key properties, and those are consistency and liveness. Consistency, you want the nodes to agree on the tra transaction order. However, currently in almost all, I would say all, consensus protocols, uh, they may agree on the order, but it may, may not be a fair order. It may not be the order in which the messages were actually received. Um, and liveness, the property, is that we, we hope that the transactions will actually be added to the log in the order that they were received. So uh, pictorial of this is messages come in to the honest nodes. It doesn't really matter what the malicious node says. 
the, the system will agree and they'll publish the, the message that the honest nodes received. Now, multi-round uh, consensus, it gets a little more complicated where multiple messages are coming in. The nodes have to agree on those multiple messages. <clears throat> but by golly, a malicious actor can, in some cases, and does, in some cases, change the order, is able to change the order. Now, how can this be? Well, blockchains, in a blockchain, the validator, who's going to be a miner, or in a case of a protocol like Avalab, a staker, a proof of stake, they can choose the transaction order. <clears throat> and uh, so, for example, here's uh, three transactions coming in. The miner takes a look at them before he publishes the block. And this is actually, I think, uh, can be a very good reason. There's a transaction fee there, which if you have a transaction you want to input, you want some priority on it, then you would pay more to have that, be sure that transaction is included in that block. Uh, the miner will accept that fee and uh, reorder your block. Um, so so the, the result of this actually is that uh, the blockchain is ephemerally, or really temporarily, is, is actually centralized. It's not truly decentralized in that concept. Well, uh, you might ask, so what? Well, for, here's an example. A, most of you probably flew in here to Barcelona at some point this week. Uh, you may have paid a little extra to get early boarding on your, on your plane. You may have paid a little extra for a better seat. I did. I got a a little bit bigger seat, and I got uh, an exit row. I think I had to pay $16 for that privilege for the exit row. Uh, so that, I mean, that's reasonable, right? Well, it is, but it can be a problem when you're doing this on a decentralized exchange, and you're dealing with other folks who you don't know. Um, so here's an example. So here's our friend Alice, a uh, smiley young lady with pigtails, the idea is innocent person, okay? And she's going to want to buy a Bob's bubble token. Uh, <clears throat> so she, uh, the going rate is a buck for a, a bubble token. So um, she puts in an order. But she makes a typo. Instead of, uh, instead of placing an order for one bubble token for a dollar, it goes in as $10. Now she notices this. Um, it goes in, she notices it right away, and uh, very quickly, maybe within a few seconds, she, um, she puts in a cancel order, and she puts in a, a fee, a transaction fee, to prioritize that uh, maybe a little more than the order she put in before. But there's a bot. Bots are, are computer programs, and they're very fast. <laughs> they run on fast machines. And they see this uh, order for, for, uh, for 10 bucks, and um, they put in a higher transaction fee and front run Alice. So um, the bot gets 10 bucks, <laughs> and Alice gets tears. <laughs> and. Uh, and maybe a little more, uh, maybe some financial ruin, depending on how much she actually put it. It was, for example, much more than a dollar. Uh, th this could be a pretty sad situation for, for Alice. Uh, the bot, might, by the meantime, has, has made 9x on, on his investment. Um, so the intuition here is the bot pays a uh, high fee uh, to the miner to front run Alice. Okay. Uh, this is not a hypothetical situation. It happens all the time. Uh, and here's, some, here's some actual uh, 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 comments on um, uh, Etherscan. Um, here's a, a gentleman said he, he, you know, he made a mistake just a couple seconds ago. Uh, I'm a stay-at-home parent, day trade. I mean, I don't know how much of this is honest, but you can appreciate, you know, there might be people in this situation um, here's another guy. Hey, you know, I made some mistakes. Another the three people, <clears throat> you know, please send the money back. I have faith in you, man. I think faith is what he means. Please. Uh, Benjamin again is a, a single parent trying to make some money on the, I, you know, again, I don't know if this is true, but, but 
The person did lose money, and he's trying to get it back. Um, please have some mercy. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and Alfie also, he needs to continue his education, might need to sell his car. Apparently, Alfie made a pretty big investment there, and, uh, and he lost it. <clears throat> and this guy's in deep doo-doo. <clears throat> so there's actually many more of these. And in fact, we've we found thousands of situations like this where you just make an honest typo mistake and um, you're, you're really uh, out of luck. Here's another interesting example. Uh, so this is uh, Decentralist Exchange, uh, a bank or they suffered a security vulnerability a couple of years ago. They did a white hat investigation to uh, to solve the problem. And this is this is a quote from them. Um, Our team, that is the bank or people, initiated a white hat attack. And while they're doing the attack, these are the operators of the system. They got hacked by a couple bots. And they lose $135,000. Um, so it just shows you how vulnerable uh, not, just, um, not just users are, but, but operators are from this, uh, this front running. So, um, so what are some takeaways? So validity, um, that is uh, fair ordering, is actually forgotten in consensus. <clears throat> And the, the dirty little secret, we'll call it, is that uh, transaction order, it, ordering is temporarily centralized. And this unfair transaction can hurt, uh, I showed you some clear cases, uh, can hurt users and even include, uh, hurt uh, operators like, uh, like uh, Bancor. So key questions are, how bad is the problem? So it's pretty bad. Uh, and in 2019, we wrote the seminal paper on this, um, on this phenomenon, MEV, uh, Flash Boys 2.0. You can easily uh, find that online, and you can find subsequent work uh, by these authors, uh, authors in this line. But we actually defined the problem, MEV, and, and measured the scope of it. Uh, what formally is fair transaction? So, so we took a stab at that. What is fair transaction ordering and how in the world could you implement it if you can define it? And that's uh, defined by this paper here and also subsequent work. So I encourage you to uh, you know, Google uh, uh, Mahinma Kelkar and Order Fairness uh, and uh, Flash Boys 2.0 and Phil Dine, and you'll be able to find these papers as well as subsequent works that to talk about this. <clears throat> so here's a few research challenges that we're addressing. So the bots don't just front run users or front run exchanges and miners, they, they, front one, they front run one another. And here's an example of a priority gas auction on, um, on Ethereum where two bots are competing uh, for a transaction, for transaction ordering. Um, and it leads to a really interesting game. And, and we found a semi-cooperative Nash equilibrium here for two players. Um, and you can read about that in the, in the Flash Boys paper where this, uh, this uh, plot is from in the bottom. Um, and what about more than two bots? Well, yeah, multiply, multiple bots will get involved in these, in these competitions. Um, how can we discourage bots in the wild? And that's another rhetorical question. I don't have a... Well, the way to discourage it is take the money away, right? Just cut off the oxygen. That, that's how you discourage it. And, and, and that's the, the thrust of, of what we're doing in the research, trying to understand uh, where it is, how it comes about, and how, what we might do to discourage it. Now, the next couple of the slides motivate some of our thinking around this issue of fair ordering. How do you define it and how do you implement it? So in multi-round visiting agreement, again, the messages will come in, and we saw the, the previous case where the, the wrong message came out. We want, the, we want the, the ordering received by the honest nodes to come out. An idea, a definition that, that we've come up with here is, is the following. If majority of nodes receive M1 before M2, then all honest nodes will deliver M1 no later than M2. So it's a pretty simple statement, and we've been able to express this mathematically. And it actually can get you pretty far in terms of implementing a fair ordering uh, algorithm or protocol. Um, but not as far as you might think. 
So fair ordering turns out has some really deep and interesting connections with other areas. Um, there's some connections with social choice theory uh, and voting. Um, Condorcet's, uh, Condorcet's paradox is a, a very famous paradox in this area. I'll talk about that in the next slide. It has connections with mechanism design and, and finance. And, um, and obviously with blockchain performance. Anytime you add something in to enforce a behavior, you're generally gonna cut into your performance metrics. So here's Condorcet's paradox. And, and this was, um, as you might expect, postulated by Monsieur Condorcet back uh, 200 years ago or so. Uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, the pseudonymous author of Alice in Wonderland, uh, who by day was a prominent mathematician, um, elucidated this more thoroughly in the 1800s. So it's, it's, um, it's a very famous uh, problem. And, and basically, what, if, you look at these, if you look at these transactions, it's a cyclic ordering. So each node is right. I mean, <laughs> each, each node basically wins. So it's, it's, it's not something you really can come up with a, a fair solution. It's a tie, essentially. Um, so, so that's something we haven't figured out how to handle yet, <clears throat> but uh, nicely, it, it's a rare, it's a rare situation. So uh, to summarize some of the work in NEV, uh, this is uh, sort of, we call it the dirty little secret. The, the transaction ordering is centralized for a time being. Um, unfact uh, the unfair transaction does hurt people. Um, and how bad is the problem? How can we uh, how can we come up with a solution to for fair ordering? And again, please refer you to uh, these authors, these first papers and the two or three subsequent papers um, uh, that are uh, you know coming out as we uh, the latest ones coming out uh, as we speak. Okay, so we talked about MEV, and uh, really just scratched the surface of what we're doing in MEV. Uh, again, I talked about some of the key findings of these first papers. I'd, really invite you to look at some of the subsequent work. Um, but I also promise to spend a little time talking about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. This is some of our latest work in IC3 uh, being led by uh, the group, uh, Professor Ari Jules at Cornell Tech. So um, you may remember seven years ago, there was this uh, mantra running through the Twitter sphere, echo chamber, code is law. Code is law. Um, and, you know, that's obvious baloney, but um, like a lot of these um, maxims that, <laughs> that run through the Twitter sphere or the echo chamber, um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, uh, law is law. Okay, uh, code's not law. law, law is law. And we have a legal expert uh, in IC3, James Grimmelman, he's a professor of law. And he just published this blog this week. If you're thinking about composing an NFT, um, please read this first uh, and maybe give James a call. He could have some help, helpful hints for you. But the, but the bottom line is uh, he's recommending that you um, build in any sort of uh, copyright thoughts into the, into the solution, um, into your NFT solution. Uh, architect it in. Uh, don't don't build it and then try to add it in later. That, that's gonna be problematical. Okay, um, so this is a shot from one of our retreats uh, we had in New York City. We get together with our sponsors and collaborators uh, about every eight months or so um, and spend a few days together talking about the latest work that we're doing, uh, getting their ideas for future work. We also have a summer blockchain camp in Ithaca. Um, it's a week-long camp of uh, lectures, tutorials, and a hackathon. We vote on best projects. It's a great time of interaction with the faculty and the students. Uh, so we invite you to participate in those and, uh, and please join us. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
um, <coughs> yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, um, transactional ordering is a really big problem. Uh, it's a hard problem to solve. Yeah. Would you be able to elaborate any potential ideas or some rough direction that you might, or the the foundation might have thought about? So yeah, the the um, the lead we're on right now is that uh, idea. I showed earlier on um, if the honest nodes receive M1 before M2, uh, then, um, uh, let me go back to how it was expressed. Sorry. Then all honest nodes deliver it no later than. Uh, the no later than turns out to be an important clause here, mathematically, and so um, that that's, that we're still tracking on that idea and and uh, addressing some of the pitfalls with it. Um, so, if you uh, look up the papers by Mahinma Kelkar, and uh, you'll get a lot more detail than than I can provide you. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, sir, for a great uh, uh, talk. Um, I wanted to inquire a little bit more about what you were talking about in the beginning about um, like uh, inherent component of social good uh, built into uh, system. How, how does that work? Is it like, um, you know, does it go directly within the smart contract to to uh, uh, carbon capture credits and, and uh, yeah. That's it. Yes, that's that's a good question. I don't have more details on on the solution. It's A I R S, and it's uh, it's a solution that uh, uh, you you can find. I'll, I'll, in fact, if you want to, uh, I'll send you a paper paper on it. Yeah. Yes, David. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Inside of a box I, is okay, but a smart I, box I, is not. I agree. Not yeah. So you could look at time stamping, you know, when it was sent. Is that what you're getting at? Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of ways to think about time, but I'm more yeah. interested in what, with fees. And you could, an alternative definition of fair is fair is the highest fee goes first. Yeah, right. What's Maybe it's. No, I mean, that's, is that a philosophical question? <laughs> it's, a, it's a practical, it is a practical question. No, it is a practical question. I mean, that goes back to my airline situation earlier. I mean, why isn't it fair that if I want extra leg room, pay an extra $16? Uh, someone else doesn't get it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fair, I, I don't have an answer to that, you know. I think what we're just trying to do is protect the Alice's out there that they, you know, first of all, just make honest mistakes and, and would like to be made whole. Um, one yes, question. Maureen. That's all right. Sorry. Um, oh, good. Thank Let you. this yeah. man go, then Maureen can go. Yeah. Um, so one question instead of like, so you're, you're addressing fear, like MEV through ordering. Do you think that uh, zero knowledge arguments would be would be an alternative to addressing the because the problem is the front running that somebody knows what's going on? Yeah, you know, we look, yeah, we've look, we're looking at that actually, and and um, yeah, they can, but but also you can have um, nefarious actors, validators, or stakers collaborating with zk's, and and they actually can get around that. <coughs> okay, so. So there's, you said they're like in the current zero knowledge technology, there are, there are collusion opportunities. There could be, yeah. So they could collude through, um, uh, behind the curtain, so to speak. Can so you people just elaborate a little bit on that? Pardon me? Can you just elaborate a little bit on how that would work? Um, well, y you and I could, could have a secret tunnel mm -hmm. where we communicate what we're going to do and the other people don't have a, the bed. That's basically the idea. So you and I and, and, uh, Justin over there could be collaborating as, as three uh, nefarious nodes with our own little secret about what we're trying to achieve, and the rest of the peop rest of the nodes here, pe audience members would not have that advantage. Okay, uh, my understanding was that the, 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 the node operators wouldn't even know what's inside the transactions, and then it would be a bit, a bit hard to um, kind of like. No, we would see the transactions. 
Yeah. So I'm saying we would communicate through the ZKs and alter, alter the transactions to our benefit. So we'd collude together. Okay. Well, I don't need to fresh up my understanding. I, I thought with zero knowledge, basically, you're just providing a proof that. Uh, like uh, going through this to new state is sort of like is complying with with sort of like all is sort of like complying with the, pre the previous state and then the transition rules or like between between states basically without saying actually what you made what, what changes you made so okay. like how would you then like how, how would you front run that or like <laughs> Let, let's talk later I was just going to get back to your question of protecting Alice. Um, yeah. I think part of the challenge is, right, if you think about normal markets, meaning like equities or whatever, if you make a fat finger mistake, yeah. right, usually the exchange will, under reasonable circumstances, invalidate the trade at the end of the day. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right? So, right. Th but, but that's because exchanges r rely on being trusted, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Whereas this is a trustless system, right? So y somehow you you want to put trust into a system that doesn't have trust, right? Right, and right. you know you could say, okay, let's get all the miners to agree that if they see an obvious mistake, mm -hmm. that they won't do it. But mm -hmm. th that's trust in a trustless system. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm kind of puzzled. I I think poor Alice. One way she could have solved this problem, perhaps, is there's an intermediary. Mm -hmm. who she deals with and right. says, I want to trade. Right. And the intermediary screws up, then they they deal with Alice. Right. But I don't know how you you do this without adding somebody in mm -hmm. who's going to do that. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, it kind of goes against the whole mm -hmm. idea, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure isn't. <laughs> doesn't give power to the people, does it? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, unfortunately, some people are dumb. And, uh, you know, that's well, even smart people make mistakes occasionally. Like you say, the fat finger uh, errors. Do. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do, and and it's really hard to see how a trustless system mm -hmm. can ever get around that. Yeah, I agree. Well, something to work on. Yeah, there's something go. to work on. <laughs> okay, that's it, right? All right, thanks everybody. Really appreciate you staying through and and for delaying your alcoholic beverage consumption. <laughs>